My name is Murray Hall and uh, I wrote a book called Walk A War In My Shoes that was released last year. Um, before we get into the nitty gritty, can I just uh, say that I want to um, acknowledge and pay respect to the traditional custodians of the land on which we meet and I also offer my respect and gratitude to members of the Australian Def Defence Force, past and present, who have protected our shores. I'm quite certain that uh, there would be members of the ADF here today, and I sincerely thank them for their service. So uh, thanks everyone for the opportunity to address you today. I appreciate it very much. It's, uh, as I said to someone earlier, it's, uh, I think it resonates with our age group because we are all connected. I'm hoping to share with you today four main points that you walk out of here and hopefully I will have maybe taught you a little bit about either family history and research. If you're a genealogy person, I'm probably sp speaking to the converted. Uh, military history and the research and they sort of blend a little bit. Obviously we'll do a little bit of a review on walk a war in my shoes. And uh, a final point would be that uh, briefly to tell you or explain to you how to take a manuscript to print because a lot of people harbour the same dream that I had. And there'll be plenty of times for questions and answers thereafter. So the story starts, I guess, if you wanted to draw a starting line in the sand 187 years ago when my great-great-grandfather walked ashore at Battery Point in Hobart. But we turn the clock forward a bit to... Uh, seven years ago. My mother passed away in 2013 and uh, she was a magnificent woman. She was considered the family uh, historian. In a filing cabinet in her office, big filing cabinet was full of all family archives. In the bottom drawer of this cabinet was a big file, so big. And it had on the, in the initials on the outside of it E-A-H, Ernest Alfred Hall. When I pulled the file out it contained the original 100-year-old letters that my great-uncle had written back from World War I. A touch before his enlistment to a week before his demise. Now, when I first picked up these documents, I appreciated the value of them from a national point of view. And my first original thought was that these documents are too valuable to be left in the bottom of a cupboard. They need to finish up with the Australian War Memorial. That's where they need to be so that if something happened to me, you're not guaranteed that someone would show the same respect to those letters as that I might. If they finished up with the Australian War Memorial, they're going to be there for another 500 years. So that's where in my mind they had to finish up. So I, what I wanted before I handed the documents over and the letters and the photographs and everything else that was in this file, I wanted to transcribe everything that I had there for my own personal record so that I had a complete copy of everything and, uh, and then I would donate them, right? So I just want to play a short video which gives you an indication of what I had in my hands. Dear Wall, I have not time to write a letter at present, but will write later if I get a chance. But I think all letters are to be stopped for six weeks from Egypt, so do not be alarmed if you do not hear from me. I have been on Cairo for the last week, but we were all called in last night, and a hundred of us were picked out today from the company to leave here tomorrow. But where to, we do not know. As a rule, the trenches have been fairly quiet about this part lately, but the other night they gave us particular hell. No doubt you saw in the paper where the 1st Battalion got cut up. Well, the party I'm with, we're within a hundred yards of it. We were in a communication trench on the way to the firing line when they started sending over aerial torpedo shells. You can be crouched down on the bottom of the trench expecting any moment for the Germans to lengthen the range of their guns a bit. As it was, the shrapnel flew over us a treat. After it was over, I went stretcher bearing, they called for volunteers, and then saw some frightful sights. Men cut to pieces, while some were killed outright with concussion. 
I don't wish to see another site like it, and I'm quite satisfied the Germans are about our equal with their artillery fire. Of course, I could not see what damage we did, but I fancy they must have got worse as our gun sent shell after shell over. I sent five rapid now and then over, but they did not signal the result. Their trench here are about 300 yards from us. Well, no more at present. Love to all, Earn. We have experienced some very heavy rain lately. The other day there was thunder, lightning and rain. It was like the guns and the thunder roaring for supremacy. I don't know who to give the verdict to, but I know which I prefer. It has alright been on the business end of the guns, but as often as not, we're on the other end. I'm still among the big noises. It's pretty lively at present. Fritz does not show any sign of giving in. Quite the reverse. He's hanging on to what he's got pretty gamely. Our artillery is keeping up a steady rain of shells onto his line, and of course he retaliates. But this side is by far the healthiest. We have had some pretty lively times now and then. What with the gases and odours of dead horses, etc. This place is no honeypot. We're getting very decent weather for this time of the year, though it's getting cooler, so I expect the weather will soon break. I have not heard from number 149 for some time, though I've written on several occasions. I believe a lot of our letters to Aussie went down on the Mongolia. Well, I think this is all for the present, so we'll close, hoping you are keeping well as I am. I sent a small parcel to Mum containing a few souvenirs, but I don't know how it will go through customs. If it passes through your hands, well, you know what to do. So long, E-A-H. Okay, so if you've got a little lump in your throat about now, then uh, my great uncle would be very pleased to know that, so thank you. Um, okay, so as I read it and started to transcribe all the letters, I become fascinated with the story. It just told a magnificent story. That was just a really brief example of what I had. I think there was maybe 52 letters or something like that and photographs, all original stuff, still holding the same the same letter that he had in his hand, so it was magnificent stuff, but the story they told was superb. But as I read the, through the letters, curiosity got the better of me. I wanted to know more, and I wanted to know more about everything that he would, the information he'd give me. I wanted to know about venues, the machinery that he was using or that he was suggesting, uh, the military terminology. Um, I wanted to know absolutely everything, so I, not only reading the letters but studying and researching everything, so I had the full picture in my head about what was going on. Um, one example was he mentioned at one time that he was learning to, uh, to be a machine gunner. So I'm not ex-military, so I wouldn't know which end of the machine gun to hang on to. So I spent a week researching um, the Vickers machine gun. I can tell you sitting right here now how to lock and load it. It fires 500 rounds a minute. It's water cooled. Um, it weighs 40 pounds. A tripod leg system. If you're in a hurry to move it, uh, boys, you better get, your, get going because it's pretty awkward. Um, and as I said, I could lock and load it for you right here and now because I studied it inside out. I, know, I now know. But that's just an example of everything else I need to know. If he was in a village, what's that village about? What were they doing in 1915, 16, 17? all that sort of information. I was just sucking the information out of everywhere that I could get. I learned how to, I taught myself how to read uh, British military maps, um, how, to, how to read the coordinates of that. Now it wasn't that difficult, but you know how we work today with longitude, latitude, Google Maps, etc. They didn't have that stuff, right? And, and longitude and latitude doesn't talk to the British war maps the same. It's like a cat talking to a dog. They don't overlay each other, right? So I had to teach myself how to do that, but it was another part of the journey. So I had everything, all these documents, and I had all this story building in my head. 
And my first thoughts were that I'd probably just put it all on paper, put it in a, maybe make 10 copies for a coffee table book, one for me and a few rallies around town that were interested in the same thing. That was my first thought process as far as what I would do with all that information. Um, but as the story grew and the, and the more information that came on board, I started to think that I might do something a bit better this, than this. And I'd say to relatives, I would annoy the hell out of relatives, especially my, especially my wife, and say, oh, Uncle Ernie did this today and Uncle Ernie did that and uh, he was here and he was there and, and annoyed the hell out of them. And the relatives would say to me at some stage, they said, mate, maybe you need to take this a bit further. Maybe you need to write a book, right? That's how the story started. That's how it happened that click, that's not a bad idea, I can do that. I'm a first time author, never been down that road before. I'll come back to that later. So from the nagging relatives, the dream was born. So I started to write, but I spent, I should point out this is a five year project. None of this was a, was a overnight blink of the eye. It took five years from start to finish to bring it to print. So uh, I started the process and and, uh, and I didn't know where to start, right? You're thinking about this, and I'm thinking about this for months and months and months. Where do you start? I had all the information, but you know, you've got to sort of put it together. But what I decided to do was to turn the clock back a little bit further. I didn't want to start the book at the time of his enlistment. You need to build the story. You need to tell, to build the background of the man. So. I had to add in a little bit of family history. Now, I had all that stuff from my mother and I had to add to the research and stuff like that. I'll come back to that again as well. But, so I turned the clock back to what I mentioned earlier about my great-great-grandfather who arrives in Hobart in 1832. Now, I'm not gonna bore you to death today with the family history part of it. You won't get bored to death with it in the book. It moves very quickly and rapidly, but it, it tells and explains the story of the man. It builds the image of the man, where he come from, what his background was how tough his life was in that era. It builds that sort of stuff, right? The really basic stuff that I'll just run past you really quickly is that my great-great-grandfather was British military background of Irish descent. He gets sent out to Tasmania, Van Diemen's Land, uh, invited to go there to develop the colony as part of the military establishment. So he turns up at Port Arthur, he runs a chain gang down there for a few years, has it fallen out with, uh, with the... Uh, with the establishment and moves north of Tasmania and, and picks up uh, 320 acres and has a potato farm, runs a few sheep up there. After a while, they moved, the family moves to Melbourne. Um, I should mention that he had two wives. One died after the seventh kid and the second wife had another eight kids after that. Right. So. He, so his, his pledge to develop the colony, he took very seriously. <laughs> so they, they turn up in Melbourne for a while. They, they run, um, they run uh, a little uh, market garden and a few sheep along the Yarra River. And I've got documents to show where they lived in, in Melbourne. You can imagine earn, uh, owning a block of land on the Yarra River at Punt Road would, would be like uh, having an acre down here on the river down here now. That's the same, same deal, be unbelievable. Um, so that's about where my great uncle comes along. Uh, he matures. He uh, moves to a little, uh, a little town called Beach Forest in Victoria. It's in the Otway Ranges. It's an absolutely magnificent place. And if you go there now, there's about 10 people live there. And you look around there and it's exactly the same as it would have been when he was, when he was there. Magnificent uh, 300 foot high mountain ash trees the tree ferns, rough, really rough, rugged terrain would have been absolutely magnificent. But to walk in there as pioneers of the area, and they were one of the first guys in there, right? But you, you can't imagine, you need to see the environment to understand how hard that would have been to walk in there and say, okay, there's a marker on the ground, there's your block of land, boys, 300 foot trees, da, 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 what are you going to do with it? So. It would, it's just an era that we can't relate to, but it would have been extremely hard. Now, I'll make an example. You woke up this morning and there's no milk in the fridge for your cup of tea and you're pretty upset about that, right? What do you do about it? You either go for a walk down to the local deli or you jump in your car, whatever, you get the milk, problem solved, okay? Let's turn our heads back to what it would have been like as a pioneer in that era 
and I'm talking 1885-ish. They rock up there and they want some milk for their cup of tea, right? So hang on a minute, let's chop down a few trees first. Let's build our log cabin. Let's get a cow, let's get the cow serviced, let's take the calf off the cow. While you're doing all this, let's dig, a, uh, let's dig an eight foot hole in the ground so that when we do get milk, we've got somewhere to store it, right? Um, and uh, then when the cow starts to produce milk, then you've got your cup of tea, okay? Uh, that just took about uh, 12 months. But anyway, that's how it works in that area. It was totally self-sufficient. It's a do-it-yourself job, right? That's how hard it would have been. Okay, so just on the family history research part of it, and like I said earlier, if you guys might be into this stuff, so if I'm already telling you something you don't know, bear with me. Um, you, the, the research you do in your family history, you cannot rely on stories passed down through the year are called folklore, right? Folklore is a magnificent story, it's warm and wonderful, makes you feel good, but it's not necessarily truth, right? It's just been passed down for a few people. So you need to do your own research and you need to do it accurately. And there's a million places in Australia where you can go and find that information. Australia, to its credit, with all our military records and our, and our history and our family history stuff, is absolutely magnificent. We would be one of the best countries in the world for those kept records. So all the obvious stuff, you know, the births, deaths and marriages, don't pay for any of that stuff. If it says pay, just push print, right? It's... Uh, there's a few cons out there and I've learnt the tricks along the way, but anyway, most of that stuff's free. Uh, cemetery records, land title records. There's a couple of websites around like Ancestry.com and that and you can go and find out who your rallies were, all that sort of stuff. Just a little bit of warning about those sites. The information there's pretty good, but don't rely on someone else having put Uncle Fred up there and, oh, that's Uncle Fred, and, and you, you steal all that information, right? You need to support whatever you're doing with documentation find Uncle Fred's birth certificate or his marriage certificate or his death certificate, it's probably one of the best ones, it's got all the kids listed, cross-reference it, then you can steal the information. Don't just assume that what someone else has written is correct, right? It's important. Okay, so back to the letters. So I got the letters and I got the information, I've researched everything to the death, but the stuff that's available in the military terminology with Australian archives is, is just beyond belief. So I... The first thing I did is I got the personnel, personal AIF file of Ernest Alfred Hall, 52 page report. I, if you've never done it, if you've got an ancestor that's uh, in the First World War, I can show you how to do it in about 15 seconds. It's the easiest thing in the world. It's got all their personnel, it's all been uh, digitised, bing, push, print, away it goes, right? As someone here earlier said also, if uh, the person died, there's a stack of information. If the person survived, there's, there's very little in there, right? But that's a good thing because that makes probably reason why you're standing here as the person survived. So I had his personnel file, 52 page report. I overlay that over the, over the, the information I already had. I then go and found the day-to-day -day intelligence reports from the battalion he was working with, right? It was, it, and I printed out every page of it for the, the 18 months that he was with him, right? Every page, it's, it files all over the place, right? But it was a fantastic journey and the detail that was in that, those battalion reports are uh, unbelievable because if he'd write back and he'd say, to, and they had to be really careful as you've already seen here I think before, when they wrote back they had to be really careful what they said because the censors would destroy the letters or they'd cry on them out or they'd just even tear the, the, the chapter out, whatever, the paragraph out, right? So he had to be careful what he said. But if he wrote back and said, um, we had a really bad night the other night, and we lost a few good men, okay? So he's given me a hint, he's given me a date. I go to the to the day-to-day uh, -day battalion intelligence reports, go back a couple of days from what the date that he'd written, bingo, there it is. A really detailed report of the coordinates of where they were working, um, the, trend, the name of the trench map that they were, uh, trench that they were in, uh, who went over the top, who come back this way, the shelling that they had, who got uh, uh, an award for having gone out and captured a machine gun, whatever. It was all in this document. So I had absolutely solid information building upon building. And those, as I mentioned earlier, those archives that are available to all of us and they're free are magnificent. So d during the journey of, of starting to build the story, starting to write a bit of here, learning, 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 it suddenly occurred to me one day that we'd never seen Uncle Ernie's medals. 
Now, my grandfather, his brother, his medals always sat in my father's house in the lounge room. I knew, we knew exactly where his was, but no one in the family, and we're pretty close, knew where Ernest's medals were. So I went to his personnel file. In the back of the personnel file is uh, the last page is the medals that he was entitled to when they were sent out to the, to the farm in Beach Forest in 1921. Um, but the document's not signed. It's not signed as having been received, right? So I write to the Australian Government, uh, Department of Defence Honours and Awards section. And I said, hey guys, can you investigate this? Because I don't believe these medals have ever been in the family's hands. And they wrote back and they said, you're right, they haven't. So six weeks later, the medals turn up at the Rolling Stone Post Office. That was the front page of the West Australian a couple of days later. It was uh, when the medals turned up 100 years later. And one of the proudest moments in my life one of the proudest moments of this entire journey was that those medals are now in my possession and they sit framed with my grandfather's medals. So that was a magnificent add-on to what I was already doing. So then I had to uh, do a bit of research, a bit of on-the-ground work. I had to, it was important that I would make trips to Belgium where his demise took part. I went to, uh, to Victoria where to the original farm. Um, I forgot to mention that I was living in Belgium as a kid, as a younger man. I was there for about three years. And I'd been to his grave site when I was 18 or 19, no, maybe older, maybe 21 years of age. I went down there and visited once. I was the first family member to ever see the grave. That's the, that's the original photograph that was sent to his mother. So, so I'd already been down there once. I took photographs on that day. I sent them back to my grandfather, who was 74 years of age at the time, living in Harvey Bay in Queensland. And that would have hurt him really badly that day, having never seen his brother's grave. And, you know, I sent him back these photographs. But I can just imagine, I thought about it a lot later, that how that would have really hurt him to have seen that. But anyway, I did it, and it was part of the thing. So in recent times, I go back to Belgium. I did two first reconnaissance trip, then I went back a second time. So I had more information, more more knowledge and, and stuff like that. And, uh, and the information that I had received there, I had trench maps, I had Google Map that was living hell out of it. I could walk down the street there without having ever stepped foot there and knew exactly where this particular farmer's paddock still is. The overlay of where the trench, where they were working, I had the whole thing. So, so I go to this, down this little country road in, in Belgium, just out of Ypres. Uh, Passion, Passchendaele's just up the corner and there's two farmhouses. There's one farmhouse on this side of the road, another farmhouse on this side of the road. Now turn the clock back to 1917, there was no farmhouses and there was no roads, right? The road just happens to run along Brudzinda Ridge, which is uh, where this took place. Now this guy's really important about what I'm going to say next. So I go to the first house over here, knock on the door, there's no one home. I go across the road to this bloke's house, uh, old farmer there. And uh, my Flemish is uh, not real flash. I could probably get us something to eat and a beer, but that's it. And his English was zero. But anyway, we got on like a house on fire. And this bloke walks me down his backyard and he says, have a look at this. And it's all great big green open paddocks, exactly as it would have been 100 years ago. He said, see those trees over there? He said, that's Polygon Wood. Up the road, that's Passchendaele. You're standing in the middle of a major battle, battlefield, Brutzind, Battle of Brutzinder. So. He takes me out to the back of his shed and the shed's chock-a-block with World War I memorabilia that his tractors have dragged up over the years, right? He's got all these shells lying around, used ones, um, detonator heads and uh, uh, barbed wire from the Germans and barbed wire from the, from the English and, uh, and he's got these little, he's got a bucket and he's got these little lead balls. Now you're very welcome to have a look at these later, we'll talk more about them later about 12 mil diameter lead balls. That's what's come out of those shells. There is millions and millions of tons of these little lead balls in the, in the fields of Flanders. Yeah? And you run your hand, you find an area, just run your hand through the ground like that and you'll come up with this stuff. Right? That's what does the damage, that was, that's what kills you. Right? Millions and millions of tons of it. So he gives me a few of those little lead balls and they sit on my desk at home with full knowledge of where they come from, the field where my great uncle was, right? 
I shall come back to that later. So he also tells me the story of the farmer. He says, because uh, I told him I'd been to the other house, and he said uh, years ago when he was a kid, um, they're working on the, on the farm and they hear an explosion. And they go across to see what's going on to his mate's house across the road, bloke his same age. They were kids. And uh, his, his mate spread all over the farm shed. Right? What his mate had done is he found a live shell because the tractors just drag it up. This stuff is f still floating to the surface now, 100, 120 years later, still floating. It will be bringing, coming to the surface in 300 years. Right? But his mate takes the live shell into the garage, said, and there's a brass ring around the, the front of the shell. He's trying to hacksaw off the brass ring because they sell the brass. Well, you can imagine how that went. All over. So every, uh, just getting sidetracked for, for a second, every Friday the, the Belgian army come round and if you're a local farmer and you, and you dig up a shell and you saw a picture of it a minute ago, they stack them on the side of the road. There's a designated point, right? It might be on your corner of your street or over in the middle of that roundabout. If you find anything, a couple of hand grenades, you go and put them there, the army comes around every Friday, throws them in the back of the truck, takes them away and blows them up. Still going on today. There was examples recently, last year I think, was the last one that I heard about, was that uh, a farmer had the back of his tractor blowing out. He'd run over a live shell, bang. And not long before that, maybe two years ago now, a farmer was killed there because the same thing happened, run over a shell. 2018 and the shell 100 years later is still killing people. Um, and there's a little add on there as well. The, the law in Belgium is that uh, you're not allowed to dig any deeper than 300 mil. 400 mil, isn't it? 400 mil. That's for the farmer's benefit. No one else, no digging, no nothing. You don't do that. Right? Okay, so just uh, I keep thinking of things that are really important to the story. So when we're there and we go to the Commonwealth War Graves. All the Commonwealth War Graves all around the world are controlled by the Commonwealth War Graves Commission and they're absolutely immaculate. I'm sure some of you blokes would have been there already. There's not a blade of grass out of place. The joints are just kept absolutely smeko. How that works is that each country in the Commonwealth pays their own way. So if there's a cemetery there and you've got, uh, and 20% of them are Australians, then the Australian government pays for the upkeep of 20% of the costs of that cemetery. That's how, that's how that works. It's an important part of the process, but they, they do a magnificent job. Absolute credit to them and the locals that do it. Okay, so I've done all the story, I've done the recon, uh, all the knowledge and the facts and da 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 is all, is all going on. And I'm, I'm riding away merrily and my office is an absolute shambles. I've got a big, uh, a big board table that someone gave me. It's nearly as big as this. And uh, I had files everywhere, I had whiteboards stacked everywhere because there was a million things going on in my head and that this information's got to finish up in here and whatever. But, and when I got to the final part, I reckon that's done. I said to my wife one day, that's it. That's as far as I can take it. But some things get missed, right? No matter how hard you try, no matter how much work you put into it, some things get missed. So I just want to share with you a little story. There's the very first letter I ever read, he talks about, now these are the original letters, so I'm transcribing them to what he's read. There's a bloke he talks about there called uh, Stephen, and I transcribe this bloke's name as Frappelli. Stephen Frappelli, right? And I cannot find this Frappelli. Everyone else that he spoke about, there's 25 of, of the blokes that have passed his way that he mentions, they're in the, mentioned in the back of the book. I did that deliberately because um, when I've read a book, you, you would have all done it. You've read a book, a character passes through the book and it's left to the reader to make a determination what happened to that bloke. I didn't want to do that. I wanted you to know what happened to those people that passed through his life. So I included him in the back of the book. But I cannot find this Frappelli bloke anywhere. Looked up the, I looked up absolutely everything. He's obviously the military stuff, can't find him. Uh, sent, uh, um, uh, da, da, when you vote, what are they called? Yeah, thanks, census, all that stuff. Can't find this bloke. Anyway, so I moved on. I sort of forgot about it. About, sorry, during the, uh, one of my trips to uh, Beach Forest, a little town, there's two resident uh, farmers that live there. They are the resident historians of the area. Their name is Zappali, right? Penny still doesn't drop, Zappali. And 
and they're magnificent people and, and they, they did a lot of help. They give me a lot of hand. I, about a month after the book is released, I go down to the Armadale RSL. I meet the manager down there and her name is Linda Zappali, connected to the Victorian Zappalis. They're related, right? The penny still doesn't drop. Frappali, Zappali, right? Still don't know. The very last name in the book of the honour roll is a bloke called Stephen Zappali. And I still don't tweak to this, right? I'm having a really bad time here trying to put this bloke. I haven't even thought about it. So one day I go back, sorry, when I met with Linda Zappali down at the Armadale RSL, she tells me this wonderful story about Stephen Zappali. And I went home and I looked him up and on Trove and whatever, and he had a magnificent story to tell this bloke. And I'm thinking about, I really need to get this bloke in here because I can go back and change things. Um, but my uncle Ernest didn't mention this bloke's name. I can't put him in if he doesn't talk about him, right? So I'm thinking about it. I go to back to the original. One day I'm at home and I'm flicking through the original paperwork that I had and I'm just going back through old stuff. And, and I see my handwritten notes, Zappali, and I twigged. It's not Zappali at all. It's Frat Pally. The same people, the same connection, the same family, da 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 da, connected at the hip everywhere. It's this Stephen bloke, right? So I'll tell you how I fixed that in a minute. Um, okay, so without giving away any spoilers with the book, it moves very fast, as I said earlier. It goes through the family history, the enlistment, the training in Victoria, the ship to Egypt, the staging camps in Egypt, then onto the Western Front and uh, what happens there. There's a fair bit of skullduggery along the way. There's a lot of million little things that happen that are of interest. Um, and it's a, it's a good story. It's not a war story in that it doesn't talk about what the generals were doing and where they were lined up here and where they were lined up. It's not a story like that. It's, a, it's one man telling his journey in his words. The book's written in the first person. They're his words telling the story. I would suggest to you that 60% of the book is his words. The rest is other information I've, I've acquired. And uh, another little spoil for the ladies that are here today is that uh, some of the best reviews I've ever had have come from women. Now, without throwing a spoiler in there, I would just say that he had a mother. All right. We'll leave that at that. So, after five years, I've got a manuscript. What do you do with it? Is a really important part because I really think that the people I meet have got or share some sort of uh, idea they might have thought about writing a book. And it's not about the subject matter. It might have been about, uh, you've got, um, you might have a passion for Irish dancing and you want to write a book on Irish dancing or it might be your own family history, whatever, right? What do you do with that? How do you take it forward? And I'm a first time author, so I'm learning all this stuff all the time. So let me share a few little secrets with you. You can spend the next three months of your life on YouTube looking up how to format a manuscript for print and you won't get to the end of it. I started it and was doing my head in. So I found a guy called, from uh, Leisure Nolte Press, um, who took me on. I needed in the first instance just a bloke to format for print. That's all I was after because I was going to self-publish, just make a handful of copies. It never intended to get to a commercial stage that it got to. That was an add-on that I never saw coming. So I said to this guy, what do I do? How, do? how does all this work? I knew that you had to have an ISBN number. Any book that gets printed has got to have an ISBN number on it, right? So you can go online, do it yourself. It costs you 80 bucks and it'll take you three weeks to fill out the paperwork that is attached to it. He says, mate, I'll do it for you for 20 bucks. No worries, you got the job. So what else can you do for me? And he said, well, we'll take it to print. This bloke and I got on real well because his, one of his rallies got killed in the same conflict, right? And his British military, ex-British intelligence, 20 years working with computers on submarines or something like that. So him and I were getting on like, like this. So he finishes the book in 10 days. He edits it, he tidies up all the military uh, terminology that I'd stuffed up or I hadn't learnt properly, whatever, and, uh, and he fixes everything up. He says, uh, oh, I had a cover that I reckon was pretty good. And this bloke's pretty sharp. He said to me one day, he said, nice cover, but maybe you want to consider a couple of options. He never told me to fix anything. He told me his options, right, smart bloke. He sends me two or three examples. That's the one we finish up with, right? 
just did it, just made it happen for me. And so I'm in love with this bloke, he's fantastic. So it's all ready, ready to go, Murray, what are you going to do now? I said, I don't know, what, do you, what happens? And he said, okay, we order one book. I said, what are you talking about, one book? He said, okay, two books, one for you, one for me. I said, how do you do that? He said, leave it with me. He said, it's called print on demand, right? Everyone sitting there, I would imagine, and I was exactly the same, you think when you go online tonight to buy a book, any book, you punch in Amazon, you pull up a book, you think that there's this bloody big warehouse in every country that's full of books that Amazon own and they just, someone walks along on night shift, pulls the book out, puts it in the mail and sends it here tomorrow. Nothing like that at all. No one carries stock. On those, all those online re uh, uh, retailers, they don't carry any stock. Doesn't happen like that. What they do, when they get the order off you tonight, they, uh, that order within a millisecond goes to Amazon, gets rerouted to the printer. In my case, the printer's in either Melbourne, uh, the UK, France or America. And depending on where you're sitting and where you've pushed the button, they make a determination then where that book is going to be printed tonight. They do it overnight and it is exactly, regardless of the venue that that book's printed in, that's exactly everything you see, 100% identical to that, right? Gets spat out the other end of the morning, the guy comes, packs it up, puts their invoice in the thing and gets sent to you, turns up a couple of days later. Now you think how wonderful is that, it's been pulled off the shelf, but it hasn't got printed on demand that day. That's how it works, right? Now the beauty of print on demand is that if you make errors or you pick up typos as we did, or you find a Stephen Zappali slash Frappali, you can fix it, right? You can't add an entire chapter because then you've got to go to a, a brand new ISBN and stuff like that, right? But if you're only adding enough to fill in gaps or adjust the page or whatever, you can do that stuff. Easy. And we did it. That's how the, any copies that are printed from six months ago have all got Frappali in it. Any information in regards to that type of work you want to do, put your hand up, I can help you. Okay, so a little bit of summing up, I guess, is that uh, there was a bit of a tidy up uh, Uncle Ernest's, Ernest's father and mother for that point. They were buried in graves, one in Colac, one in Kew, and uh, when we went and had a look at their graves, they were about as bare as this table. So in recent times, uh, the last one is going to happen on the... 7th of March in a couple of weeks time. Uh, the family's had a bit of a whip around and we've acknowledged those people. They've now got, they've now got me memorial stones acknowledging them, their life and uh, pioneers of the area. That, that got fixed. It was a little bit of an add-on to what we've learnt. Um, if you're not doing anything on Saturday the 13th of June, the highest accolade I can deliver to my great uncle is that at the Australian War Memorial in Canberra, he will be honoured in the nightly last post service. And uh, that for me is about as high as this land can take that is to do that for him. That televised live every night, it's at five o'clock every night. Every night for I think the last two or three years they've acknowledged a soldier. I applied for it on, on the 13th of June this year. We're going to Canberra and, and there'll be tears and it'll be fantastic. Just uh, a couple other quick things I guess. As I said, I've had some magnificent things happen to me since the book came out, things I really never saw coming, uh, involved with people, the ability to come and, and, and tell a little bit of the story and share those things with you. Um, but there's been some really big highlights along the way, and I just want to share a couple of really nice ones with you. And uh, maybe uh, three months after the book's published, a woman rings me one day. This was what I was touching on before about the female thing, is, uh, and she's crying. Her, guts out. She was really blubbering like a best friend just died or something like this, right? So I twigged, for, I didn't know this woman, never met her before in my life. We've become pretty good mates since, but that's another story. She is crying so hard, I can hardly get a word in, and I settle down, settle down, calm down. I know it's about the book. Settle down, settle down. And I finally get it out of her. She says, I'm up to page da 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 in the book, and I needed to speak with you. I needed to say hello because I'm broken, right? She started crying, we had to hang up. Now that really struck a chord with me that someone would be crying over my great uncle a hundred years later, over something he did, not his demise, over something he was actually doing, right? 
and someone's ringing me to tell me about that and crying about it, like that, that really tore at me. Yeah? I was proud, <coughs> so proud that someone would be doing it. The other story was, I'm in my home about the same time, maybe three, four months after the book came out. I live in uh, Rolling Stone, a little bit of a property, and I've got a long driveway, I can hear and see people coming. And Sunday afternoon, I'm sitting at home with my wife, and I hear a car coming up the driveway. I said, we expecting visitors? I said, no. So I go walk out the front, have a look. This really flash car, not, not hoon flash, but flash car, comes up the driveway nice and clean. Da -da. And a bloke gets out, he's got a suit on, right? Now the hairs in the back of my neck start standing up because fr Sunday afternoon, bloke with a suit, flash car. This is, can't be good news. He gets out of the car and he calls me by name. And I was nearly going to tell him I was my brother, but I didn't, <laughs> too sure. About I said, yeah, Murray Hall. He said, I've got a letter for you. I've got something for you. And he's holding a letter like this. And I'm, and I'm thinking, this has got to be a summons or something, right? I've, and I'm thinking to myself, what have I done here? And I'm ratting my brain. I mean, my wife's in that look watching me from the, from the lounge room, and she's doing exactly the same thing. What's this stupid bugger done now? Right? Anyway, this bloke, I said, what's in it? He said, oh, it's all, it's all in there, mate. Hands the letter over, right? Jumps in the car and drives out down the driveway. And I'm standing in the driveway like this, shaking with his letter. Anyway, I open it up. And it's a letter from a retired West Australian Supreme Court judge who had just finished reading my book, right? It's a confidential letter, so it doesn't matter who it is, you'd know him. Um, and it's two page letter and it's absolutely magnificent. He was telling that he, he loved the book and he loved the journey and it related to his family and this and that and, that and, that and it was absolutely magnificent. I loved it and kept it. But the very last sentence sat me on my bum, right? What he said, he called Uncle Ernie a hero. Now, I had never considered that or thought that or used that word or that terminology before. A hundred years later, he's calling my uncle a hero from the First World War. So I sat down in the driveway and I cried my guts out that someone would do that, that someone would say that. It was really emotional, it was, but it was a highlight that someone would do that for me, right? Okay, so just in summary, in the back of the book, you will see that there is two uh, advertisement. Let's not beat around the bush, but they're... These people have crossed my paths in my journey and they beca actually become friends. So you, th you see it in the back of the book, you think it's an ad. It's not an ad. It's, it's a favour return for people that have passed and helped me. This mob, uh, they do tours in, in and around the Western Front. They're magnificent people. They're, they're just great people and they do a great job and if you're ever in need of them, I couldn't re recommend them more highly. Another one is a Belgium guy that crossed my path in the research of the book and we become pretty good mates and we found out later that we we're very well connected through the sport of cycling as well, we're bonded in that way. So we've got a few things going for us, yeah? Now what this fella does, he's, he's a Belgian war historian and he lives in Ypres, near Passchendaele, near everything else I've spoken about, not far from the Somme, he lives an hour and a half from the Somme, da da. So he'll, He'll help you with your research if you, if you want to say, okay, can you find my man? Someone here earlier said they had four relatives killed in the same conflict. He can help with all that. But he does a bit more than just the research. He goes into the field. He will find out where your relative was last sighted, exactly the same as what I did with that. And he'll walk the field and he'll run his fingers through the field and he'll find those lead balls where your relative last stood, right? and he'll give you all that information. He then will use those lead balls from that field and he makes this magnificent lead poppy. It's a sign of remembrance and you know where that come from, where that lead come from. So it's a beautiful story. He's a magnificent bloke and my pleasure to introduce you to Jan from Belgium and his lovely wife Steph are here today all the way from Belgium. So.